Good morning, Faith Fellowship. Happy Sabbath to everyone. It is always wonderful to come together to worship the Lord here and with our family online. It is a joy to know that you are joining us to come and just praise God, to worship Him, and to proclaim together that He is faithful and that He is good. I have very much enjoyed this series on the revelation of Jesus Christ. There is there's nothing better than talking about who he is, who our tremendous God is. He has so many names that we could not ever exhaust all that he is. In this story, I have focused on three things, uh, three identities of God, three names and three, three um, titles as our creator God, as judge, and as a commander-in-chief, because those are just ring out to me in these, uh, the first part of the Great Tribulation, this Revelation story declaring who he is and what he is going to do. Those plans are underway this day. Today we are one day closer to that appointed time of the end. It is coming. It is going to be soon. And I hope that you are longing for that day. We're, we've been, or I've been focusing on the first 1260 days of Daniel's 12, 12, 1335 days. And today we're going to conclude, we're going to get to day 1260. And we can't get there without talking about listening to the appearing of Satan on this planet. Just the thought of that sounds so out there. Is, is this really going to happen? Well, the Bible declares that it is going to happen, and you and I need to know exactly how that unfolds and why he is going to appear on the planet. It is important to know the why. So as I was contemplating, like, Lord, I don't really like talking about Satan, but we have talked about it today. So what should we give back to you this morning in our, in, our, uh, in our reading, in our words to you? And so stand with me because we're going to read the end of the story. We're going to go beyond that this morning to, to Revelation 22. Behold, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me to give to each according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by its gates. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come and the one who desires the water of life to drink freely. How good is the Lord? Pray with me. We know that you are coming soon. We know that that day is going to come right on time. We know that that is an, an appointed time before the creation of the world. You are faithful. You are good. You are ready to come and get your people, and you will be here right on time. As we wait, Lord, in this timing that we know, in our impatience, in our longing, empower us this day to glorify you, to praise you, to do the things that you have in store for us to do for your kingdom. As we look at the two futures, day by day, Lord, I can't live any other way. Doing the things that you're calling me to do for this day, but my heart is in the big rescue mission and being with you forever. And so empower each one of us to balance those through your wisdom, to proclaim your goodness daily, and to be a vessel of love that flows freely back to you and to those around us. Because I pray in the name of the one who is coming to redeem, to take his children home, one day very soon. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, 
when we look at Revelation's story, it is an incredible story talking about and telling us about a cosmic drama that began in heaven. And so sin not only affected our planet, but it affected the heavens because the rebellion started there and came here. And in heaven, Lucifer chose to rebel against God. In fact, pride welled up in him so much that he wanted God's place. And it is an incredible to me, far beyond what I can possibly even process, that a God who created a creature would allow him would allow what has happened. Our God is not intimidated. Our God has no rivals. He has no equal. He has given his creation an incredible power. He has allowed Lucifer to retain this power. And he has allowed Lucifer and his followers, one-third of the angels that defied and rebelled, to continue to live to demonstrate what sin produces when fully given power. And that's what we're going to be looking at in Revelation's story. We don't have to look far to see the effects of sin. We don't have to look very far to see the horrendous, despicable things that are going on on our planet. Things that we never thought would happen are here. And the devil is pressing his agenda because he actually knows God's word better than most people. He understands the plan. He knows that he is going to be given an opportunity, and he intends on taking full advantage of that opportunity. From the beginning was this thing called worship. We will be there again. It was in heaven, and at the end, it will be again. Jesus will declare Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Jesus will demand worship. And until Satan is allowed to appear, he will be manipulating and coercing worship through a system that I spoke about last week called Babylon, confusion. A, the Bible calls it a beast that comes out of the sea, a, a group of people a conglomeration of leadership from every religious system that has no idea what to do when God does this. When God wrecks this planet, so the first four trumpets totally wreck the planet, and so that God can arrest the attention of the world. That is the why. This is why it's coming. Time is up. We are down to the last 1,335 days. God loves the world. He wants to rescue as many people from the grip of sin and Satan as he can. And he will declare in this disaster that he is love, that he wants to grant salvation to anyone, to whosoever will, put their faith in him and worship him. And worship is always about obedience. You can't have worship without obedience. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? If you love me, you will obey me. And John goes on to say, and his commands are not burdensome. No, because if you love him, whatever he asks of you, of course, Lord, yes, Lord. The second angel And this is, again, the message will go out through God's servant prophets, 144,000 servant prophets telling everyone, this system, do not believe it. Babylon is false. It's going to be giving you 
serving up maddening wine. What it's telling you is adulterous. Do not go along with it. Don't drink in these lies. And Satan will be manipulating everything from behind. When, when we talk about a beast, this is what we're looking at. We're looking at m- unreasonable people who are unwilling. God uses animals because you can't reason with animals. You can train them. You can train animals, but you can't reason with them. And this is what this will be. It will be a group of leaders. Political leaders will have no clue what to do. They will turn over power to religious leaders. Religious leaders won't know what to do because each one is stuck in their, in their paradigm, in their religious rituals and tradition, and everyone will go off to make rules for their own groups of people. What kind of rules? What will be going on during this time? Well, here's one thing that will be loud and clear. This is God. This is Almighty God, and his wrath is being poured out because he is angry with with the way that we've been behaving. And yes, he is. Yes, he is. And so how do we get this to stop will be the issue rather than Lord, I am sorry. We are sorry for what we've been doing. We want to walk in repentance. See, this will be what the 144,000 will be saying. It is time to repent. You can't be a part of God's kingdom without repentance. You have to recognize that what you are doing is wrong and turn from it. And there are those that will listen and that will come along. And as, as Babylon is pushing its agenda God's pushing his agenda. Satan will be pushing his agenda through Babylon and through, through the leadership of how we can appease God rather than please God. And so there will come a time of tremendous persecution that will arise during this time. And it will be a time like we have never seen. And in this time, there will be testing of every person's faith. And as I was driving this morning and thinking about that, I had this just this vision of, of Jesus walking us through the fire, holding our hand, each one, that test of faith. When you walk through the fire, I will be with you. I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. I will be with you. He holds our hands. We rely on him. We have confidence in him. Talked about that last week. And he will walk us through. He is our shepherd. He is our king. He is our deliverer, our provider, our refuge. We will not be going through this by ourselves. He will be going with us, and then he will seal us. Tremendous. You and I can walk in freedom today. The freedom to love, to worship, to obey, to draw near to. An incredible God who goes to great lengths to save his people. And if you and I are living during that time, there will be much suffering. But it's going to be unlike any other time because God is looking to save and seal. And in that sealing, we will be sealed from fear. See, that's always Satan's card. When he wants to manipulate he instills fear. Didn't we just go through a season of fear a couple of years ago when that fear gripped the entire planet? It's a sample of what's coming except 100 times worse because our planet will be in a huge disaster. Think back to the fear that seized people and how people were afraid to be around each other. That's Satan's. MO. That's what he wants to do to separate, to paralyze our faith in fear. 
There is going to be no fear. The Spirit of God will be pressing down on those who love God. He will be empowering us with power like we've never seen before to walk through the fire. And on the other side then is going to come a, an incredible like from the book of Acts, but on steroids. The camaraderie of love that is going to come upon God's people as they are sealed and as each one goes and gives everything to bring others in. It's going to be like in the book of Acts where they came, they were coming together to pray all the time. It, us in whatever little pockets we are, our only concern will be bringing others into the kingdom, doing the Father's will. What will you have me do today, Lord? Who, can, who needs to hear? Who needs to be encouraged? Who needs nurturing? Lord, will I be sacrificed today to win one more? That is the gift of the sealing that God is going to bring. You and I could not handle that time. Neither could the 144,000 without this gift. That God, he's perfect. God has designed perfection because he's perfect in all of his ways. You and I don't need to fear. We don't need to be concerned. Our God is for us. He's responsible for us. We belong to him. No fear. Love casts out fear. We rely on that fear. People of God, now is the time to continue to solidify that faith, to have oil in your lamp from the experience that you're having with God every single day. You know his presence. You know his power. You understand that he's working all things for your good. You know that he, you've experienced the shower of mercy that he's given you, that you've needed to wash away your sin. You know that your God has redeemed you. You know that he loves you and that he is going before you and that nothing surprises him and that if today is your last day, you will be secure until he calls your name and raises you you up on day 1335. It's a tremendous plan that God has, not just to redeem people, but to encourage. It's going to be the best and the worst. We'll see people turning and giving their lives for others, and then we will see people that we know that rebel and turn against. And we will sorrow it won't be that we will be afraid. It will be that we will have deep sorrow for those who refuse the gift of salvation. And God's going to push this agenda for over two years. The majority of the time will be God working through his 144,000, the Holy Spirit pressing down in great power, making the gospel, the eternal gospel, as clear as possible. The 144,000 will be healing. The blind will see. The lame will walk. Evidence of God's tremendous power to hear, to hear God's words, to accept Jesus as their Savior and as their God. And that agenda will get pushed. And when it looks like it cannot be pushed any longer, then and only then, God knows how long it will take to get to this point. And there is an appointed day when he will allow something so incredible. The third angel's message says, the third angel followed and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast, this, whatever this world government, whatever they are saying to do, instead of doing what God says to do. Whoever worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. This is a warning. It's a promise. What God says he's going to do, he is going to do. God is going to allow Satan to appear 
right now, Satan and his demons are on this planet, but we can't see them. They live in the invisible world. When Revelation 9 says that he's going to come out of the abyss, it means that he comes from the spirit world of darkness, invisible, he's invisible, into the visible world. God is going to allow him to be seen. And Satan has many names. In Revelation 12, he's called the great red dragon, the ancient serpent. Um, he's called the angel king of the abyss. In Revelation 13, 14, he's called the lawless one, the man doomed to destruction in 2 Thessalonians 2. This throws a lot of people off when it says the man doomed to destruction. And people want to make this, you know, this, this being to be a person. What this means is that Satan's going to be allowed to take on a form that we know, a human form, like Jesus did. So he's called a man. He's going to look like us. Um, the fallen star, Abaddon and Apollyon, the stern-faced king from Daniel 8, and from uh, Daniel 11, the master of intrigue, and then from uh, think Revelation 19, the false prophet. There are many ways that God is telling us and point, pinpointing who he is. When Satan appears, and you know, we're warned... If you hear that he's over there, don't go see him. Don't go over there. The delusion's going to be so powerful that even you and I could be deceived because you, can, you can't even imagine, and I can't even imagine, when God allows him to step out, we, we're told in Revelation 13 that the saints are given over to the beast to be conquered. The beast is manipulated by Satan. It's, it's like, the, the puppet and the handmaster. The hand is really uh, running the puppet. The beast, this worldwide government, one world order government that, that takes place, it's just a puppet for Satan. And God is warning, don't listen to that. Worship as I declare to be worshiped. And you and I know that the Sabbath will be a part of that. Because that's obedience. God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The first four commandments declare God, how we love God. And the others, the other six, are how we love people. And so this is the law that is going to be required. They're called commandments for a reason. And those that put their faith in Jesus will be happy and blessed to submit to God's authority in any way that he requires. And so there will be a huge problem, in not only within the government, but within people. If this is going to separate families. It's going to cause great distress uh, amongst friends and neighbors. It is, it is going to be the worst and the best. People will group together according to whether they're being led by the spirit or whether they're being led by fear and the flesh and go along with whatever's being told. God will press his agenda. And I want for us to get this clear. Those that rebel, those that, that are go going to go along with this world order, with this beast, and then with the image of the beast, I'll talk about that in a minute, they're going to perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. What can God do when someone refuses his offer of salvation? What can God do when someone refuses to allow him to love them? What can God do? God will not manipulate. God will not coerce. God will not force. He will force a decision. He will say, choose but the choice is always ours. During this time, he's going to be dealing with carnal hearts. And every one of us wants to be king and rule over our own heart. That we, we came from the womb that way. Don't tell me what to do. But do you have a Pharaoh's heart or do you have a Nebuchadnezzar's heart? Nebuchadnezzar allowed himself to be humbled. Pharaoh did not. We will see Nebuchadnezzar in the kingdom. 
Pharaoh will not be in the kingdom because he only was willing to let God's people go because he was crushed for a moment. But as soon as he thought about it for two moments, he was chasing after God's people and he was destroyed. And God says, anybody that refuses to love the truth and so be saved, there's nothing I can do for them. So get this, because this, this is an important part of the story for you to get on the whys of why this happens. For this reason, say it with me, for this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have done what? Delighted in wickedness. Not just participated, but do, do have done what? Have delighted. Remember that I've been speaking about the fact that Jesus will be judging. And everyone is going to make one of two choices. God is bringing the choices before humanity. And because people are alive, they have to choose while they are alive. God gives clear evidence of the gospel, of who he is, of what his agenda is. And the majority of the world will refuse. So God says, you don't want the truth? I have to stamp life or death on you because we're almost out of time. By this time, there's maybe a year left of 1260 days of mercy. And God says, this, this is it. You have to make a choice. So which God will you serve? Here you go. So this powerful delusion. When Satan appears, he will appear to be God Almighty. I imagine every place he appears, it'll be like the second coming all over again. Except that God won't allow him to do the second coming, the way that he's going to, where everyone sees him at the same time. It will be, the delusion will be so powerful, he will have access to all power. He will even call fire down from heaven, which is a sign of divinity. Remember when, when Elijah said, you know, when the fire came down from heaven and, and burned up the altar? Um, so those that have refused the offer of salvation, those who have not heeded the warning that the 144,000, there will be a warning going out that this is going to happen. God always warns us. If we're listening, he warns us before we get ourselves in any kind of trouble. We get ourselves in any kind of trouble because we didn't heed the warnings that he was telling us, and then boom, we, fart, we, we wind up in a trap. God will allow this delusion Satan will come in, and then he will insist, and he will demand that an image to the beast be made. Now, this is what's really interesting. Up to this point, people will be holding on to their religions. The Catholic will re refuse to let go of Catholicism. The Buddhists will refuse to let go of Buddhism. The Muslims will refuse. And God will be speaking to each one in their pockets of understanding, through, through brothers and sisters that know where they're coming from, will declare the truth, they will refuse to let go. All of you know and understand because you have had to let go of your paradigms to get to where you are today. If you're listening right now, it's because you had to let go of something to allow yourself to start investigating at least what Revelation story is telling us. Well, Satan won't have any of that. Satan will have no, no rivals. No religious system is going to trump him, so he will dissolve every religious system. He will demand now, God is here, everyone's going to worship me. And in that, some will be saved when they realize what? And they will abandon their religion, and they will be able to be brought in. Those that have lived in fear, that have rebelled, that have been on the fence will make a decision, and then he will demand that anyone who wants to be a part of his kingdom and be able to 
buy, sell, receive any of the incredible blessings that he's going to be performing, miraculous signs. I imagine he'll be feeding tens of thousands. And if you want to come and get any of this, then you will have to declare your allegiance to me. So you have the prince of light and the prince of darkness, the angel king of the abyss, and the God of heaven, warring for every soul. And by the time we get to day 1260, which is the seventh trumpet, everyone will have a mark of ownership on them. The saints will wear an invisible seal of God, and the wicked will have a visible mark on their hand or on their forehead. Revelation 10 says, In the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets, and that is the mystery of God, that he is going to seal by the time that that seventh trumpet sounds, and he, it will be finished. When day 1260 comes, everything will be over as far as salvation. The sheep and the goats, everyone has chosen what side to go to. And I marvel at the lengths. When you look at this plan, there are so many different, there are more, many more parts to this story. The, there, this is not a you know, exhaustive study in this book. I want for you to know the big picture. I want, I want for you to have a clear, beautiful sketch of what God is doing, why he's going to bring utter destruction, why he is going to allow Satan to come, why the suffering's going to happen, why he's going to do all the things that he does. We have to know the whys. And God is about saving as many people as possible through the means that he has to use. If God could just come and just have a big Bible study with the world and everyone would listen, he would do that. But you can hardly get someone to come in for a Bible study. There's a lot better things to do. And so imagine trying to bring the gospel into people that are not spiritual. It, it only happens through a huge two-by-four along the side of the head for every one of us, even those of us that know. We have to get a reality check. God wants for us to check to see, do we love him above everything else? And for you and I, do we love God more than his blessings? Do we love God more than the things he's given us? People, things, work, whatever it may be. Is he the love of our lives so as we go through this time, it's close. The atrocities that are happening daily, I cannot imagine how our God is even able to stomach this. The vulgarities of, of the desecration of his creation and the things that are being forced upon our children all over this planet are despicable. How much longer, Lord? And so as you and I wait, I want to wrap up with reminding you who you are. Your identity is in Christ. You belong to him. He rescued you from a life of sin. You have given your life to him. You have witnessed his love over and over in your lives. You have experienced his power. You have felt his mercy washing over you. This is experience. This is in your jar to fuel your light. Every single day, take note and of the experience that God is having with you and that you are having with him. Stay connected to the source of power. If you're feeling far away from God, Guess who moved? Stay close. Listen to his voice. 
rely on the love that he has for you every day so that when we get to the trials of the tribulation, whether, whether those trials are come this day, whether something happens this day that is your tribulation and you don't make it into the great tribulation, you and I don't know if we'll be here tomorrow. We don't know if we'll be here next Sabbath, but we know who knows. And he loves each one of us. And we must rely on him so, so deeply that we will not be shaken because he is going to shake the church first and shake out the imposters to bring in those who are simply overwhelmed by his goodness and come rushing in. And it will be a joy for you and I to see that and to be a part of that and to have that camaraderie during that time. I cannot wait. Depend on your God. Know that there is no fear in his plan. He does not want you to be afraid. He wants for you to have the highest awe and respect that he deserves to have from you. That is the fear that he declares when he says, fear God and give him glory. Because brothers and sisters, he deserves the glory. You and I are going to give that glory to someone or something. We're made to worship. We have a little worship spot in our souls. We will worship. We are made to worship. What or whom will we worship? God's given us a power to choose. We can worship our money. We can worship our position. We can worship our work. We can worship people. Or we can worship the God who has given us all of those things. And if we're not clear on worship and we live into the great tribulation, we will worship God's great enemy and our great enemy. You know, when, when God, when Lucifer comes as God, when Satan comes as God, he'll want to gather up all the followers that he can gather, but not because he cares about them, not because he loves them, just because he hates God. And he wants to take as many people away from God because evil is what he delights in. And that is why in 2 Thessalonians 2, it's very clear they've delighted in wickedness. If we refuse to love the truth, we are going to delight in wickedness. So may we allow God to empower us. This is what's coming for all of us. When I saw this, I'm going, Lord, you're going to take that rainbow back. So discussing what's been done with the rainbow in this last generation, but God is going to take it back. And when he comes in all of his glory, you and I, we're either going to be standing there because God empowered us to see him coming in the clouds, or we're going to be raised up out of the grave to come and live with him forever, whichever it is. It'll be perfect. Whether we sleep and don't have to live to the great tribulation, that's okay. But if we live today, I tell the Lord, but even better, Lord, is to get to see day one. <laughs> I would love to see day one. And the best would be to get to be at day 1335 and get to see the whole movie play out. But it is God's choice. And I trust him that he will take each one of us to the end. I pray that each one will allow our tremendous God to continue to change us daily, to walk in repentance, to live in the light, and to be used for God's kingdom. There is nothing better. May God bless each one of you as you live a surrendered life in power, in total confidence, knowing that you can rely on your God and have complete confidence that he will get you all the way into the promised land. Let's pray together.